about 9.05 here, and uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll keep admitting people when uh, they come in. I don't know if I'll uh, continue to use this uh, waiting room. It's, it was a recommendation by Zoom that you let people go to a waiting room first before you bring them in, but um, I'm not sure we need that. But anyways, what are you talking so, about? This is all high security stuff. You can't be letting people sneak in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, this is our first time doing this, obviously. Um, and the idea is just uh, provide an hour where all of us can get together and talk about stuff, ask questions. And if we get a lull in the uh, conversation, then I've got a question that I was going to ask uh, people that have been turning for a while. And um, so this is really for, uh, for everyone that's called in. Uh, we do have one question that we'll start with from Mark, who uh, emailed a question in. And Mark, go ahead, you can ask the question live and I think jo John's going to answer that. Great, thanks Roger. Um, can, I, can you all hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so I, back in November, I got a Laguna 1836 and rough turned my first few larger bowls about, you know, uh, uh, up to 15 inches in diameter. And so now those are dried and I'm starting to turn them and I've started with the smaller ones and I'm working my way up. Um, tr traditionally I would just take the, the bottom of my bowl and, and, um, you know, place it uh, with some padding against my chuck and then bring up the tailstock and, and secure it that way to uh, return the tenon to make sure that that's true before flipping it around and mounting it in the, in the chuck. But for those bigger bowls, that kind of seems uh, maybe uh, less than optimal. And so I'm wondering what kind of a jam chuck or uh, you know, just just what I need to hook hook myself up with to to be doing this the right okay, way. So, so John, well, you want to answer that? Well, I don't know if I'm going to tell you the right way, but I'm going to tell you how I do. But uh, so I'm going to switch cameras, and this camera seems to lock up a little bit. Hopefully, I'm in a better position now, and it doesn't lock up as much. Okay. So uh, I guess the question for everyone can can do. You, do you see on John full screen? If you don't, you may want to go to speaker view, uh, which is- Oh, that's a good idea. That's a great idea. Yeah. In yeah. The upper right is, uh, and then if everyone else could uh, sort of mute, because uh, every time you talk, you'll, uh, you'll take over the screen. Um, so go ahead, John. All right, so I'm gonna try to get this thing centered up. But I need to I need to get it back on the screen so so I can see I see Roger but I don't I well, can't. we see your, we see your leg now so okay so mm -hmm. you're good all right so I have several drive spurs I'm going to try to show I have a bunch of them okay so I usually use these, but I also have an extension, cur courtesy of my Amazon wish list. So the way I do it, because the bowls are so warped, uh, my preferred method is to use my cold jaw like this, but if they're too warped, it doesn't fit in there right. So what I've done is I came up with a plan B. Can you can you see the Yeah, the view looks good, Roger. Right there. <coughs> so I put the extension in and then I use this drive center because this one doesn't tear up the wood and the worst that's going to happen is the piece is going to slip. So I put that in there, then I mount the bowl because I already have my center, and this is a bigger, deeper bowl. It's also pretty badly warped. So I put that here. 
and I run oh, up the wow. tail stop. And then I can just spin it and I can move it and adjust it until I get it pretty close. Then once I get it close, I lock it down and then I can return my pen in here. And then I, I, I usually start all the way down on my lathe. So I'll start my speed as low as my lathe goes at 100. And make sure that I'm running pretty true right here. But you can see that this one worked pretty good. So I'll go ahead and readjust it until I get it where I want it as centered as I can get it. And then I'll just recut my pen in here. The other way I've done it, th this is for a deeper bowl. And the reason I use this extension is so that the bowl doesn't hit my headstock. It also gives me a lot of flexibility on being able to turn and manipulate the bowl to get my original pen in as close to being back centered as I can. Is that, can you see that? Does that make sense? Yeah, that is a great explanation. R really uh, simple. I shouldn't need to uh, really do much of anything. Uh, I think, and I don't know if I have an extension, um, but I, I, I should be able to, um, I, I've got quite a bit of uh, room behind my headstock. I believe a bowl can go around. So, yeah, that should be all set up. So, John, th this is Dean. I I've got a question to that, if I can. Um, go ahead. So, when you're doing that fine adjusting, are you adjusting the tail side or are you adjusting the head side? Because yes. what I find sometimes is that I'll have the tenon fairly well centered, you know, on the tailstock side. But if you're off on the the, the 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 top side of the bowl um then when you go to to you know maybe centered and that you, you fix your tenon then when you set your bowl it's so lopsided that that you get my point you know the, the, the top side of it isn't centered um you, you've done yourself a lot of harm um you're taking off a lot of a lot of wood from the bowl uh, yeah, so I I will adjust whichever one I need to to get the to get it where where I need it to be centered up. Sometimes I'll move it on the, on the headstock side. Sometimes I'll move it on the tailstock side. Normally, though, I I tend to leave this the headstock side centered because when I when I turn the bowl, I make a divot there, and that is centered on the bowl. So. This is already marked to the center of the bowl. And what, however the bowl moves, I normally don't have as much trouble losing too much of the bowl if I stay centered on the inside of the bowl. Do you put a mark on the, on the center of your bowl as it's drying, or, or can you just see it because that's where the, the concentric, the middle of the concentric circles come in? When I wet turn it, I put a divot there. All right. That's so I mark my center when I wet turn it and it dries and it, it's going to work. And then I, I, I will manipulate either the headstock side or the tailstock side just to, to try to get the most out of the bowl. Because you're right, sometimes the bowls work so bad and I have another one I'll show you in a minute that I would do a different, that I'm going to do mount a different way because that bowl is so warped. So let me switch to the other one. I'm not actually going to turn this right now. I'm just showing how to set it up. But when you're turning your tenon, that, that's how I center it up so that I can get the, the new tenon. And then normally when I... You're off screen, I, sir. Okay. When I rough turn these, that when, I, when I chew that tenon up, I usually use the biggest tenon I can do when I rough turn them. But that, because that allows me to go down one size on my jaws to the next size tenon down, regardless of how out around this gets. 
but the other one, so I'm going to take this out. While you're doing that, John, uh, Tom Willing has a comment about this also. Uh, yeah, something I use instead of uh, the drive center that's on such a narrow uh, surface area, small surface area, I mount a oh, four or five inch long bullnose uh, drive block in my chuck, <clears throat> and that distributes the contact point inside the bowl a little more evenly out on a little bit bigger diameter and that addresses some of the things you're talking about right now it kind of helps you average out where it goes so that you wind up as centered as possible and i've i've rescued some pretty out of whack bowls by doing that and i'm not in my shop so i can't just pick it up and show you what i mean but um, I, I do a similar thing, Tom, is using my biggest chuck with the biggest jaws uh, yes. for, the, yeah. for the bowl. Put a little padding in there. Yeah, Bill? Um, I that's, that's the way I usually do it, too. I, I have a, a larger Nova chuck called Titan with uh, the bigger jaws that I spread them open. And then um, I found some stuff at a, a local floor carpeting uh, place. It's called Carpet Underlayment, and it's... It's um, oh, it looks like carpet padding. It's carpet padding. That's exactly what it is. But it's but it's the stiff stuff. It's not the it's not the soft spongy stuff. So it it feels like like there. It, it almost feels like cork would feel. So I would imagine cork would be the same thing. And I they were thin, so I just rubber cemented two of them together, and they they're pretty pliable. And I've had these for years. Um, and I found that they don't mark the thing, but it holds the the inside of the bowl really really well and as tom said it kind of distributes the weight evenly so that i don't get any chatter as i'm as i'm going up the, the outside of the bowl to to uh to to true it up yeah i do the same thing bill i i when we put in some area carpets my wife and i i got some underlay uh under carpet that has like a rubber on one side too, or something mm. like that, that yeah. provides a real good grab on the wood side of the. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, that's essentially what I'm doing now. Um, I don't have the um, the high density uh, under padding, but mm -hmm. it's uh, you know it's carpet padding. It's a little grippy, so it's 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 gripping the wood and it's not marring it. I was just. Um, yeah, I was I was curious. So so people don't use like a jam chuck or, or anything. Well, you can I, use a jam chuck. Yes, definitely. Tom, I think Tom was saying that. I mean, that that sort of acts as a jam chuck, really. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's I I would consider that a jam chuck. Okay. I, okay. I use a jam chuck, and uh, as you go on and you've got a finished bowl, I use the same approach for finishing off the bottom especially if I don't if I don't have a blank around that's big enough to use for a jam chuck for a big bowl then I do that same compression thing and carefully <laughs> I nibble the uh, spigot on the bottom side of the bowl down on the live center uh, yes on the tailstock okay. side and I get it down to oh centimeters something like that uh, I go slowly, sharp tools, all that stuff. And I get it down small enough, then I just take it off the lathe and finish it with a, uh, a fishtail gouge, you know, a wide, flat gouge. And it's a little bit of finishing out, but you don't know that it hasn't been turned when you get done. Yeah, nice. So I, I also have a jam chuck. Uh, I have this one that uh, used to have a radius on it, but I, I cut this one off and used it for something else. I think I used this for the Beads of Courage when I was uh, making those. But I do have, uh, to your point, it, it, it does grab a wider surface area. Uh, but since I'm turning slow, because uh, I, I don't turn it very fast when I'm recutting the tendon. But the other option I, that I do is... Uh, like this one, this one's really badly warped. I don't know if you can you see that. Oh yeah. So that one's got a lot of warpage to it. So no matter what, I, but I also left it pretty thick. So this one I'm going to mount the opposite way, 
and I'm going to use a drive spur here and come in here. And this one, because it's shallower, and I'm going to try to get it as close as I can. And, and what I'm really paying attention is the tenants. And I want the tenant side to run as cool as I can get it. Because that's the bottom of the bowl and I have I have less room on this particular bowl. But what I'm going to do now is I will chew up this face first. So I'll get this side flat and then I'll take it and I'll put it in my larger coal jaw. So I got a flat against this. And then I can use my live center and chew up my tenon on the other side. So uh, if you don't have these, the other way works better. But uh, so the same, it's the same principle. I'm, you're, you're grabbing it between the center on the inside and the center on the outside, and you're manipulating it to, to turn away as little of the bowl as you can. Good. So Mark, you had a, a second part of your question. About turning green? Did I? Asking whether you should leave it on the lathe. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, the other night I, I was turning a great big piece of bir uh, birch wood uh, that I came across in Beaverton a, a couple weeks back. And um, yeah, just soaking wet. And 10 o'clock, I needed to go to bed. The bowl wasn't finished. Um, so, so I put a bag around it so that it wouldn't, wouldn't crack too much. And I went to bed and I tossed and turned because I couldn't stop thinking about it. I thought is, boy, is that pulling on my spindle? Is that gonna, um, is that gonna damage my lathe leaving that on overnight, uh, with, with all of that torque pulling on my spindle. And so, uh, I, I think I went downstairs and I just pulled up the tail stock and I secured the tail stock against it so that it wasn't hanging it was it was supported um but i just wanted to know am i, am I being overly cautious am i am i being overly um tender with my lathe or is yes. that is that something <clears throat> i should be concerned about not to worry no. okay no. in my opinion no go ahead mike uh you know I was, everyone has a different way of of doing these things and for platters particularly, I use, let's see, go back to speaker view here. I use this sort of thing. Um, I have a, um, a face plate that has a removable face on it. So I've got several of this size. This is the one I use for platters since they, they warp quite a bit. But actually on the bowl topic, um, you know, the production turners, Glenn Lucas actually has a video on this subject out. And let's see, the way he does it. There. Um, I've actually made these and for larger bowls, they work really well. If you can see, this is just a, a circle with uh, two pieces of the semicircular glued onto it with a, a uh, an adhesive sort of grabby surface on it. And what you do is you wind up, you put the the high points of your bowl that's moved in here, um, you trap it between your your between the board and between the the tailstock, and you move the bowl such that there is an even um, even space around the outside, and wherever your tailstock is is where the center of your new um, center of your new um, um, tenon is going to be. And it's very quick, very easy, and it works really well. That's rubber on the uh, edges there? Yeah, this is, this is um, again, this is what I use is the, the lab drawer rubber that I've got, you know. Uh -huh. When I retired, anything that had dust on it was mine and came home. <laughs> uh, so I have, a, you know, a couple of rolls of this, this foam that we used to line the lab drawers with so the glassware didn't break. And it works really easy and really fast. You wind up losing a very small amount of your bowl because you, 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 um, by the time you've moved this around so that it's even on all the edges, 
you've conserved as much of the diameter of the bowl as you can, uh, plus you've got a new center, you know, wherever your tailstock is, you cut a new tenon, you've got a new tenon that's um, made specifically for that, that, um, for that circumference. So anyway, that's on, you know, Glenn, <laughs> Glenn is, uh, if you don't, if you follow Glenn Lucas on Instagram, He's very good about sharing stuff. Yeah. And he has no classes these days. <laughs> the plague came to Ireland, as he said the other day. And uh, so he started, he started making uh, YouTube videos. And there was a YouTube video on this particular topic, recentering. Oh, uh, great. It's really, it's quick, it's easy, it's fast. Um, and you, you know, you make the bowl, you be your bowl holder once, and any size bowl will will work. Like I said, for smaller bowls, I use the, the bull nose center and kind of do the same thing. Hmm. Uh, I, have the thing is, I have a follow-up question to what Mark was asking is, has anyone been successful in taking a uh, piece of green wood and turning it all the way down and being done? And how have you done that? Depends what you want in the end. <laughs> I have done some recently with some of this ash that of the tree that fell down in my field and I turned them green right down to about a quarter of an inch thick and um, they turn oval they turned no not yet they're out I didn't bring them in the house I varnished them I mean I treated them with their oil I buffed them and everything but they're on the deck outside which is kind of an in-between outside and inside temperature mm -hmm. undercover and mm -hmm. so far they're flat as a pancake sitting on the table mm -hmm. nice Anybody else, Bill? I think the key uh, is going to be how slow they dry, I hope, but it's an experiment. Yeah, I, I, um, I would say, Roger, that it depends on, like, like Mike said, what you want. And also, like, the species of the wood um, itself is um, you kind of determines what you'll get out of it. Um, the, the, I had a lot of um, plum recently that I turned, and let me grab <laughs> Turned half of them, um, you know, to final, final dimension, and um, and and half of them I, I rough turned and then left on my floor and you know did the ceiling and all that stuff on it. Um, but and so these are really really warped, but they warped so that they didn't crack. But the, the, the rough turn ones that I left there, I had to babysit every day because they were just cracking like crazy. Um, and so I would suggest like some of the fruit woods, it, it might behoove you to, to do, to actually finish, you know, turning in one session and, and turn it to thin. And how thin do you think you have to be to make it work? Quarter inch? Three. Yeah, these are about a quarter, just a little less than a quarter inch. Um, but, but, and that's, and the best part about it is you, you get to turn wet wood and that's like usually the, it's the funnest wood to turn. The, and then yeah. you, you put a finish over the wet wood? Um, I, I wait until it dries. I don't know if I need to or not, but I, I wait until it dries and then I'll sand it after it dries and then um, I'll put the, the doctor's um, wood shop micro aggregate wax and walnut oil on it. So you don't sand it when it's wet. Pardon? You don't sand it when it's green, when it's wet. No, I don't. I don't know why. I think it's just because I don't like it, the sandpaper clogging up so much, but I, I don't know. I feel like I, I can determine whether I get all the scratches out better when I'm, when it's dry than when it's wet. Mm. I, I would love to, I actually, I'd love to know what you guys think about sanding wet too, because I, I don't know much about that. Anyone else have a comment? I uh, have had a similar experience as Bill, uh, depending on the species of the wood, it just warps uh, so much that to rough turn it thick just doesn't work. I picked up a bunch of apple wood up in Washington a couple months ago and it's just beautiful, beautiful grain, but the stuff was just cracking as I was turning it. It was so, um, so prone to warping. Uh, so on the advice of, of a couple of people, I turned it down to about a quarter of an inch thick, 
And then I actually, I, I bought a really large stock pot at Goodwill before all of this went down. And I'm glad I did because I've been boiling a few of my more warp prone pieces. Um, so I tossed, let's see if I can get a shot of this. <laughs> um, I tossed this piece in the stock pot and boiled it for about uh, oh, 20 to 40 minutes. And it's, as you can see, it's, it's warped a little bit, but nothing compared to the other pieces um, that, I've, that I've tried to turn with this. And it's just, it's got some really nice complex grain patterns in there that I'm really excited to, yeah. to get a finish on it and, and finish it up. So that's- I'll jump in with a little bit about boiling. Uh, woods like Madrone, fruit woods um what's the one with the cockleburs sweet gum a lot of those woods benefit i'll turn them green uh, rough them green boil them right away for two hours and then let them season for six months and you can get a basically a geometric bowl as opposed to a warped one out of those um i was trying to find pictures on my photographs, which is why I ducked away there for a second. But um, another thing you can do, this, this is great fun. You probably have heard of this. Um, and I've done it a lot with things like holly, uh, turn them green down to two, three mil. Uh, I'm not talking about big bowls here, throw them in the mic, you can have them dry in a couple of shots of uh, a minute at a time in the microwave. And they just go all gallywumpus and uh look crazy and people love them they, oh, interesting they're very was popular it, was it hustle look that blew up the microwave over at kim west when he was doing a demonstration uh yeah it was it um no i think don Derry took out the light fixture and it was yeah, don Derry was the light so i, <laughs> yeah, I, I think hustle look was doing that and and suddenly there was smoke and flame <laughs> <laughs> you do have to be careful that's why i say one minute shots yeah, um, you know, let it cool off a little bit between shots. Um, I'll go see if I can find those. Um, uh, find a picture of those bowls. I've got one somewhere. Yeah, I'd love to see that. I just got some holly recently that I'm I'm looking forward to turning. No, yeah, holly, holly is very tolerant to turn if you don't have a lot of uh, knots in it. So I'll duck away for a second and see if I can find that. Hey Tom, before you go, what what does uh, boiling do? Oh, you're, you're muted. Sorry about that. Okay, boiling uh, heats the lignans in the wood that hold the fibers in a certain orientation. So everything relaxes. And so when it cools off again, it solidifies again and uh, in a new orientation. So it releases all the tensions in the wood. Oh, okay. And Particularly for Madrone, that's uh, Dale Larson boils most of his Madrone. Uh -huh. Yeah, I had good luck with a couple of hollow. I picked up some, uh, you know, four inch in diameter Madrone branches from a coworker recently, and played around with those. And yeah, the first piece I did, I I left it maybe three eighths of an inch thick and just let it let it dry, and the thing practically exploded down the side. It just ripped itself open. Yeah. Um, so, so the next couple I did, um, I, I turned thin and then boiled. Uh, here's one that I did. Um, yeah, I don't know. Turned out okay. Yeah. Beautiful wood. Cool. So I've got a piece of myrtle that uh, I didn't realize it was as wet as it was until I was almost done. Uh, and this one started to work on me. And what I did to it is I just finished. I used uh, doctor's wood finish on it on the outside and left the inside uh, unfinished. And I let it dry that way for about a month until it was completely dry. And then I did the inside. So I, I've had some luck with green wood finishing and putting 
walnut oil or something on the outside and leaving it dry from the inside and I get less cracks and less warpage that way. I don't know why. Interesting. It just seems to work. I would think oil is fine to put on green, but something like a, a poly finish probably would not be a good idea. I don't know. Uh, the, they say that the reason that the, the wet wood cracks at the surface is that the water is moving to where it can evaporate. So you have evaporation pulling the water out of the wood. The problem is the water moves faster than through the wood than the water moves off the surface. So you wind up with a traffic jam at the surface of the wood, and that force actually is what cracks the wood. Mm. Uh, that's the other thing about boiling. When you, when you relax the lignin, you open up the pipes. So you let water get out of the wood a little faster after boiling it. Oh. So you get less crackage. Yeah, Christian Bouchard made his living for years on Madrone objects that, you know, were not boiled, turned thin, and they were going to turn inside out, and the people love them. So, like I said, it's what you want. When you turn green wood, you what do you want at the end? Um, yeah. Cool. And with bowls, you've got two sides opposite short grain between the two surfaces. And then you've got two sides opposite each other, young grain. So the water is moving out of the short grain much faster. Yeah. And that introduces all kinds of tensions. Yeah. Which is why roughing works because uh, the wood can actually tolerate those tensions while it moves around. That's why it moves. And if the wood is too thick, the tensions aren't relieved sufficiently, so you wind up getting cracking. So turning yeah. as thin as you're comfortable with with a green bowl is a, is a pretty good idea. Well, that explains that explains why when I oil the outside or, uh, and let it dry from the inside, it doesn't crack as much. Yes. And, you know, if you're... Uh, seasoning spindle blanks, what do you do? You dip the ends and leave the long grain exposed. Yeah. So when you talk yeah. about turning thin, thin is what, three-eighths or less or thinner than that? It's a balancing act. You've got to figure out where the the shift in the seasoning is going to make the bowl so oval that you your circle doesn't overlap the oval. Yeah. I got a piece that Bill gave me that's probably paper thin. <laughs> okay. I, I've got a question to with regard to drying that probably belongs in drying 101. Um, Go ahead. So I, when I seal a piece of wet wood, I've heard two things, that I should just seal the end grains and leave the face grain alone. The other approach is to seal the whole thing. Which one works better? I mean, to Tom's point with regard to the circle being, being bigger than the oval, I've got one piece that I could never get back to circle because it's become so ovate that it, if I was to try to get it to, cir to, to a circle now, it would, there'd be no bowl. Right. A rule of thumb for that, and just a rule of thumb, is um, when you rough it down, you want to leave the wall thickness 10 to 12, even maybe as much as 15% with something that moves a lot. Um, and then you're, you're doing a tightrope walk between uh, leaving enough to keep it so you're off your and so much crack because of the tensions that are stored in it. So it can be a juggle. Yeah, I try to use that 10% rule, but it, it on this particular piece, it just didn't seem to work. And I'm, I'm, I think that I had just sealed the end grains on it. I'm not sure. Maybe I, maybe I missed and hit the side grain, the, the face grain and not the... Yeah, what was the species? Say again. What was the species? <sighs> Gee, I, I think it was birch. I'm not sure. 
I don't have a lot no, of no, experience. No, 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 no. I think it was Birch beach. Moves. I'm sorry, Beach, not Birch. Beach, yeah. I have a little bit of experience with Beechwood. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as sealing the wood, what, what Mike has taught me was uh, just do the end grain and about an inch up the side grain or so. And also uh, make sure you don't have any sharp corners. So if, you, if you're doing a bowl, uh, round, round the uh, inside and outside corners and then seal the end grain. So that's sort of what I do. Yeah, if you leave that, that sharp edge on it, you've got a, a fine point where the water can actually exert maximum pressure. So if you've got a rounded edge, you know, it, right. it's going to survive a little longer. And, and the species makes all the difference in the world. Fruit wood is going to move like crazy. Uh, madrone is going to move like crazy. These are all woods that have very high native water content, which is why a moisture meter is not a, not a frivolous expenditure. Um, if you, you know, look at a bowl, you really, you feel it, you know, and it's heavy. You say, well, it's, <coughs> excuse me, still wet. How wet is wet? Um, if it's, dried down to say 40 percent you've already lost most of the most of the water in that in that piece so you can you know you don't have to take take extreme measures but if you got a piece of fresh uh particularly fruit wood um, it'll actually peg your moisture meter because the fruit woods and madrone and um myrtle have very high uh, water contents to begin with from it comes from the places where they grow where there's just a lot of water so you wind up with this very wet wood um, that is, when you, when you open the surface, the water's gonna try to go wherever it can. So you need to give it as much of an escape route. And, and you know, if for, like with Madrone, if, I've got, if I'm gonna make a, a, a Madrone piece, I will anchor seal the whole thing and just count on it taking you know, a long time to dry. But it doesn't move quite so fast. You know, and a bowl's always going to move. You're going to see a contraction along the, the, the end grain and <coughs> less motion along the long grain. So, you know, the oval, you can predict which way the oval is going to go. But knowing how much water you're starting with is not a bad thing. If you use a moisture meter, uh, how low do you uh, want to get before you start turning it? Um. I like to, I'll let it sit until it gets down to around f at least 40%. 40? Yeah. Because you can take a 40% bowl and turn it down to, you know, a 40% a, a blank, turn it down to your 10% sidewall, and it's not going to move that much. You've gotten rid of most of the bulk water. In this climate, 15% is dry, really. 10 to 15% is just as dry as it's going to get. You know, I, I, when I go down to Arizona uh, in January, I take wood with me. And wood that I think is dry here, by the time I'm in Arizona for 24 hours, has cracks in it. So, <laughs> so wherever you so are. So, Mike, are you, um, are you talking about waiting to get to 40% before you rough turn it? If you can, yeah. Yep. Okay, so so not taking it right off the tree and rough if, turning it. If, if you have the place to store the wood until it's going to dry out a little bit, you know, anchor seal the end grain, or actually the the plastic wrap works pretty well um, for cutting it down. But yeah, I'll let it dry as long as I can. You know, if that piece suddenly becomes perfect for what I want to make, off we go. But if yeah. I can let it sit. <laughs> You know, it, the drier you can get it before you turn it, the, the better off you are. The more, the easier it's going to be. E even though you're, okay. And and then it, you, you say run it down to 40% and rough turn it as opposed to city, letting it sit for a year. You reduce the risk of cracking in the blank yeah. by yeah. by turning. Okay. I mean, it, it's, I'm, I'm lucky. I have, I have a place where I can store wood for quite a while. Um, and it, it, if you can do that, it's great. If you can't, you deal with it. I guess what's but, confusing right. to me is that uh, when I, when I measure a green, uh, new piece of wood with my moisture meter, it's, 
uh, in the 35 to 40 percent range. Totally green. I, it may depend on the the, the moisture meter. Okay. Mine when I when I measure um, uh, the moisture meter, and a lot of times actually I'll just use uh, a voltmeter and just measure resistance, and I have a table I've calculated. Okay. Um, <laughs> Because for, for me, when I use mine, to me, 30, 30 to 40% is off the tree. And then I uh, wait till it gets in the 15% range before I turn it. Yeah, with mine, it'll run, it'll me measure about 60%. Well, wow. your meter. Yeah. Huh. So it, it depends on, you know, all, all your moisture meter is doing is a resistance calculation between the two points. Um, it's sending out a current and measuring the resistance against that and putting a number on it. So within, you know, you calibrate your own meter. Uh -huh. What is dead wet and what is dead dry, and then you go from there. Yeah. You mentioned uh, wrapping it in plastic. You like that better than uh, anchor seal? It's a lot less messy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> having, having ruined more pairs of pants with anchor seal than I can count. Um, yeah, Bill? Yeah, I found, I found that um, I, I saw that trick on um, one of Reed Gray, you know, the Robo Hippies um, mm -hmm. YouTube channel, which is, if you don't follow him, you really should. He's got a wealth of information. He's an old coot, but he's, um, yes. he's got a lot of... He's not uh, old. Uh, he's, <laughs> a <young boy. laughs> uh, he's a young coot. <laughs> he's a coot in training. A um, <laughs> that, that, that doesn't... <laughs> Yeah, he, he, he wraps the, the saran wrap around it, and that's just, you know, you can get that stuff at Harbor Freight or something, and it's, you know, a buck or two, and it's super cheap. You wrap it around a few times, and I actually found that it, it does help, you know, keep it from drying out on the the, rim, the outside rims of the, the bowls. Um, and so I've, I've used a combination of it. I've used just the, the um, thing that just kind of, it's all sort of experimental. Um, one thing I did want to mention along with what was really important you talking about like um, breaking the edges when you're rough turning a bowl to set it aside to dry and so you don't have any right angles you always kind of you know round over the lips and even the tenons and all that another really important thing to do is to make sure that your sides are of even uh, width all the way all the way down that I found that you know when I did it and didn't know better, I would keep it a little thicker, you know, on the, on the bottom or a little thicker on the top and invariably it will crack. And I don't know the whole physics behind it, but um, even wall thickness is, is, is great for like finished turned pieces, but it's also really important for rough turned pieces. Good. It's, so a question with regard to that saran wrap approach you're talking about, you're talking about wrapping the piece off the tree when it's in saran yeah, wrap. Yeah, reduced, reduced to, a, to a round. Yeah, All right. I will take a round uh, cylindrical blank, you know, a flat cylinder, and I'll put plastic around that, uh, especially if I think I'm not going to get to the uh, piece and do the rough turning down from around. Like a donut? No, not a donut. What do you call it? Hockey puck. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we try not to make donuts. Take yeah. a square block, cut it, make it round. So now it's a hockey puck, and I'll put plastic around that to keep it from drying too fast. If I'm not going to get to it around so all of it, or just that. the ingrain parts? Just the circumference. You leave, the, you leave the ingrain open? No. No, you're not, you're not the wrapping the flat sides. The you're flat wrapping range. the round sides. I got you. You leave it that way long enough. Sometimes you even have spalting. Yep. I have had that happen. Hmm. I did an experiment. A bunch of us cut some oak behind uh, Mike Porter's house, and I did an unintended experiment because I ran out of anchor seal towards the end. So some of them I did the whole outside and the rim. And other ones, I just did the end grain. And the ones that I just did the end grain on that oak all cracked. But the ones I did the whole thing took two years to dry, but, but they didn't crack or warp anywhere near as bad. Yeah. So do you think the plastic makes it dry quicker or slower? Or it doesn't matter? I would say slower. slower which slower. you want. Yeah. Hmm. And, it, you know, you can get 
you can buy the the film. I I order all, all a lot of stuff from a company called Uline. Yeah. Uh, up in Auburn, Washington, and they sell the it's it's for pallet wrapping. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you get you know a, a, a roll that's probably fourteen inches wide, and you can just set the blank on the end of that and just roll it up in that and pull it tight once and it's very quick. It's you know I started doing that if to to get the wood sealed until I had time to go anchor seal it. And I, I wound up, you know, not anchor sealing a couple of pieces and they turned out really well. Yeah. yeah so, Mike, Mike Porter has an example of that. If you can see it, say something, Mike. The uh, quick way to do around the front of the wall, these, these are very, very cheap because it's part of our story of spending work. Yeah. Uh, I've had a lot of experience. <clears throat> oh, I did some uh, silver maple a couple of years ago. And that heavily exposed when I wrapped the entire wires, bolt lengths, and they're sitting down there waiting, maybe they'll show up the auction or somebody can do it or no spot. We'll exchange some favors anyway. Cool, oh, thanks. So, could a hey, Roger, could I ask on me listening, Mike is echoing. Do you know yeah, how I'm not sure why? I, no, no, you're supposed to say why. <laughs> <laughs> His, his audio is fine when he joined. Um, so, Gary, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I just brought in uh, uh, a bowl I'd call Don't Show and Tell, probably, um, that uh, I can share. It's kind of a dog dish, and I was looking for advice on how to – it's rough turned as a dog dish, and uh, that's not my objective, but that's where we start. <laughs> and uh, let me grab it here somewhere. Which one it is? It's going to – uh, yeah, is that dog dish showing? Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's a piece of white um, ash, American white ash I picked up from a friend's uh, <coughs> yard, and um, it's a crotch piece, and uh, kind of it's a couple years old. So early on for me doing a green turn, and uh, it's a pretty ugly shape as you can see. Uh, and I was just looking for advice on how to get from here to something more attractive. And your advice could range all the way to make a platter, <laughs> but <laughs> what's inside it. So I'm kind of interested in keeping the uh, crotch anyway. Anybody want to chime in? Well, I think it's got great potential. Don't give up. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, I, I see an ugly duckling there. You got some things going on that could be very nice. If it's uh, ash, you're absolutely lucky it didn't crack like all crazy. Yeah. Yeah, so I just sealed, so this playing off our last conversation, I just sealed the end grain. Basically, that's just uh, end seal um, and uh, not, a, not a crack at, at all. Yeah. I, I would say, um, Gary, one thing, I would watch that uh, bark inclusion on at about ten o'clock um, on that that one that's on your screen. Well, oh, no, yeah. go back to the other one. Yeah, uh, about ten o'clock, top top right. Uh, sorry, t- top left. I don't know my left from my right. Yeah, no. looks like there's a little bit of a bark inclusion. You just have to be careful with that. Yeah, yeah, I definitely. I ended up having you know some features like that in this other bowl that I turned off the same tree. Yeah, that's uh, not quite as uh, dramatic uh, inclusion, though. If you want to keep the bark on the live edge, drizzle some thin CA glue all over it. You know, I'm, I'm kind of open to whether I keep the bark or not. I didn't think it was particularly attractive uh, bark, but um, it, it does go down quite a ways on the one on the upper right side there, the <laughs> two o'clock side. The one at 10 o'clock, uh, if you want to preserve that, I. I would probably seal that with CA glue before you turn it. But I, I don't I don't think the shape of it's bad the way it is. Oh. I've got one that's a, even more of a dog dish, but uh, I was too embarrassed to bring that one in. Yeah. <laughs> I love that term, dog dish. Yeah. I've got a lot of those. <laughs> yeah, we all do. Yeah, I, think, I think Howard Borer told me about dog dishes, and then I went and made one. Yeah. <laughs> he inspired you, yeah. Then you have to go out and buy a dog then. Well, I was I've, got say, I've, not, I've got a few of those and I don't have a dog. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
Hey, you know, in, in terms of advice, then I was just thinking, you know, I, it's pretty thick. It's probably an inch and a quarter, so I've actually got some space to play around, particularly with the bottom edge, so I can probably get a real curvature out of it without destroying it. We've well, got enough thickness to work with, and and you know, it's firewood in, firewood out. If you yeah. don't like what you wind up with, you know, winter is coming. So <laughs> true. I know one thing that that I sort of learned is when I got a shitty bowl and it doesn't look good, I just basically take it down uh, and reduce the uh, the height of it until it's it's a nice round one and take it from a natural edge to a real edge mm -hmm. uh, and try to preserve it that way. And sometimes you can spend a, an inordinate amount of time trying to fix something that doesn't look very good. Or if you just, you know, take the top couple inches off, then you got a, a decent bowl. So. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And speaking of which, I wanted to sh share with you one thing that I would recommend you not do. And a friend of mine, said, I got this root, uh, maple tree root. Oh. <laughs> Started like this. I helped him take it out of the ground. And then with my chainsaw, I went through, <laughs> I dulled four chains yes. to get it to something where I got a few rounds out of it. And I let it dry for about six months and got a bowl with all these, once I dug all the sand out, which uh, dulls your tools instantly, uh, we got all these big holes and stuff. And so I tried the coffee ground uh, route. And one thing about my coffee grounds, they weren't ground real thin, real fine. So that was a, a bad thing, but I used a, absolute ton of CA glue to, uh, to fill it and ended up with uh, not having enough coffee grounds. So I started putting in some uh, copper fillings in there to uh, add a little, little flavor. But I will tell you, I spent more time on this friggin bowl than is worth it. But if anyone says I got a root burl for you uh, <laughs> say thank you very much i have a friend who would be happy to turn it <laughs> now root burls can be gorgeous but you're going to find whatever it grew in you know that that the thing on in dale's shop the one that says there's no such thing as free wood <laughs> there should be a, an annex for root burls because it they can be beautiful particularly yeah. black walnut root burl is, is gorgeous I tell you, they, they just nail your tools. They nail everything. And you will find nails and rocks and sand. Yeah. You know, it's, like, it's like turning teak, which is, is beautiful, but, you know, you're going to file your tools down to nubs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's 10 o'clock. Uh, so, real quick, I have an know. alternative to when you're using too much CA glue. Yeah. I use the clear two-part epoxy, the Gorilla, because it dries every bit as clear as the CA glue, and this is a lot cheaper. I'm sure, yeah, good idea. You know, I, I have a question for, for future sessions. Um, let's say we wanted to do a, 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 a turning talk on a topic. Should we invite an expert? So the talk of natural edge bowls brought it to mind. You know, yeah. um, Tom Hastings, um, does as nice a natural edge bowl as anywhere. So if we want to talk about natural edge bowls, could we just send Tom the link and see if he could join us for that? For sure. Sure. In you know, fact, I, everyone, everyone that's joined, I'd appreciate your feedback uh, on, is this worth doing again? I think it was sort of fun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any improvements that we can, can do on this? I think I'm going to uh, not use the waiting room because I forgot to add some people and I apologize. To, to the, for that, uh, for later, brought him in late. But um, other than that, uh, I think it was fun. Yeah, Mike, was one thing that I can help is uh, I probably could have done a better job of answering the question on how to put up a rough turn bowl that warped if if I hadn't got that at like eight thirty. 
<laughs> I, I disagree. I, I found this very helpful and, and um, feel ready to go down into the shop and turn, turn some of those larger bowls I've got drying. Thanks, everybody. Cool. I agree. Yeah. I think the format is well worth, you know, and it's what are you going to do from 9 to 10 on Saturday morning? Sit and drink <laughs> coffee. Might as well talk wood turning. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I'd I love to hear about my Can I ask, this. Uh, ask you a question, Mike? Sure. Go ahead. Um, you said you, you uh, developed a table for uh, wood dryness using your uh, ohm meter. Uh, can you share that uh, uh, table? No, yeah, it, it, it works on my, my ohm meter in my resistance, uh, the, the, um, the Fluca resistance meter. And if you've got the meter, all, all you need to do is just put your resistance probes on and record as a piece dries. Um, record the resistance and then weigh it. So you've got, and that's all I did. You got a, you've got a, a resistance, you know, a fixed distance apart. I use an inch and a half. Okay. Yeah. Inch and a half between the probes, and with the same piece of wood, measured the resistance and then measured the wood, and you can you can see the wood drying and you can see the resistance uh, going up. So I mean, that's all there is to it. Porter, okay. while you got, well, I've got you there. Um, I love to see your paintings on Instagram. Sometime, could you do a series from blank canvas to sort of steps through the process? Because mm -hmm. uh, for those of us that don't do it, the end, the end product is great, but the process is interesting also. I, um, some of my friends do that, Mike. Thanks for the compliment. Um, that's a good idea. I should try to do that. Uh, then there's the, the part of probably at the end of the, Painting when I crumble it up and put it in the recycle bin. Do you want to see well, that? You know, <laughs> all done that. You know, sort of an analog to firewood in, firewood out. It exactly is the same analog. So anyway, um, since I have uh, the the floor rarely, Roger, as a potential future talk, um, cutting up uh, a kind of a problem part wood or a mysterious piece of wood properly with a chainsaw, get it for blanks. For example, I was given just before the restrictions went in place, a uh, section of apple trunk, apple tree trunk that's probably about 12 to 14 inches in diameter and has a number of large fat burls on the outside of it. Oh. I have no idea how to cut those properly. I also have another piece of plum trunk about the same, no burls, but I'm always a little mis mystified by how to cut up fruit wood properly so that you get the best out <clears throat> for cutting. And I don't know if that can be done on a meeting like this or not, I really don't know, unless um, I provided some photographs, for example, and then we talked through the pointing with the photograph or something, I don't know. I just thought maybe that could be a potential talk. Yeah, we can talk about that offline and see what we can do. Yeah. Could I, could I ask? Before you uh, let too much time go by, get them cut down the pith. Um, Okay, that means I would have to cut the trunks into sections uh, because, like I said, it's about six to eight feet long, both trunks. Oh. Oh, wow. And, and I'm not sure how. Yeah, how to start. Oh, these are logs you've got. They're logs, yeah. Okay. That's a good question. How do you start with, from scratch to the finished product? So, and one oh. of the trunks has big burls on the outside of it, and... I'm looking at it. I've never done that before, so I'm not yeah. sure about that. Harvey, you had a question? Oh, I was just going to uh, say that um, John's photograph showing his lathe, that worked great. I mean, it was a high-definition video, and I was curious what kind of camera and stuff he did to switch back and forth. Well, I have this one which is just a little GoPro camera. And when you hook it up, there's a, a next to your little video icon on the bottom of your screen, there's a little up arrow and that's how you switch back and forth between cameras. And that's on the GoPro software or the Zoom? On Zoom. Cool. Well, I, I, can't, I can't figure out how to get my high definition Handycam camcorder to work on here. But my cheap little GoPro worked great. Yeah, looked great. Thank you for doing that. So I, I was I, just think, 
thinking that if Mike t wants to try and do live, whatever John did worked well. Okay. I'm not sure we want to do it with a chainsaw, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sarah, you had a question? No, I was saying thank you. Oh, uh, okay. Like namaste, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> I've got a it was a great, a, a, a great conversation. Thanks. If I can, I've got a quick question before we go. I do have a piece of root burl, and I'm wondering how to cut it to start. Should I cut it as if it was a piece of round from, in other words, down through the middle of the pith, or what would, on that axis? Oh, what I said, cut down the pith. What I meant was, if you've got a round. Uh, just take your chainsaw and go uh, across the middle. Understood. I'm wondering what I should do with my... Off to one side, cut the pith down. Yeah, I understand. Uh, I'm wondering what I should do with my root burl. Oh, what I sorry. found is hard to find the pith in the root burl. Yeah. Yeah, I, I realize that. But am I cutting along that axis? I don't know. It sounds like you might want to give it to Roger. He likes it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was my I mean, basically, I looked at the one I showed you and, you know, just try to find where you can preserve, get the most wood out of it because, you know, a third of it, a third of it's going to be junk and go from there. Once you get it cut in half, then you can make more intelligent decisions. But that first cut, really hard. <laughs> it was, was for me. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what axis I should be cutting it in half. Well, the a root burl really is not going to have a pith. I understand it's, that. Because you're on the low side of the, the root shoot layer in the plant. So the, the, the pith goes up from that differentiation point. So treat it kind of as a piece of wood separate from anything else. And if you're lucky, you'll get a uniform cross section out of those bits of the burl. But have, have lots of chainsaws available yeah. to cha chains. Cause and you might get lucky. It happens. Yeah. yeah, my comment about cutting down the pith was related to logs, not the root burl. Uh, understood. But we were talking about root burls, and I haven't made the first cut yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your, your having, chainsaw will be smoking pretty quick. Having done a bunch of those, just cut it based on shape. Yeah. To worry about. And you're going to need a ton of wood hardener probably, too, before you're done if it's an old one. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, thank everybody and uh, end the meeting, and we'll uh, see about scheduling this again. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Roger. Roger. Well done, Roger. Thanks, 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 yeah, Roger. excellent. Thank you. thank you, John. Thanks, very helpful. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Good night. Good night, John boy. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.